Okay, quick recap. So we started looking at the HVAC loads in a zone. And we talked about the different components of those loads and then modeled them on the site chart. Same thing with the HVAC process that is designed to address those loads. And then we continued by looking at the HVAC equipment designed to, to provide that load management. So with something like a chiller, we looked at the different components of the refrigerant cycle and we looked at how that looks on the saturation diagram. So with something like a pH diagram, understanding how the pressure and enthalpy changes and how we can quantify some of the energy associated with each of those phases. And now we're going to turn our attention to something we haven't talked about, which is the pumping devices that move between the plant and the zone. These pumping systems are really designed to transfer that heat load between something like a zone coil and in this case an evaporator barrel of a chiller. So we've laid the foundation a little bit when we were talking about refrigerant compressors, which are another device designed to pressurize a heat loop. With water systems, there's not as much variation in devices. The centrifugal pump is really the powerhouse of the HVAC hydronic system. And in particular, it's going to have a lot of similarities with the centrifugal compressor that we looked at. So let's look at some of those similarities. So first, they're both dynamic devices rather than being a positive displacement or piston style compressor or pump, which means that you have a spinning device, we call an impeller, that's going to accelerate and pressurize the fluid, driven by an electric motor. And because of the shape and geometry and operation of these devices, they're going to have some of the same efficiency characteristics, some of the same leakage and hydraulic losses and they're both going to be susceptible to damage from having a fluid other than what was designed for the compressor pump driven through it. So in the case of the compressor we talked about slugging and flooding where you have the liquid phase of the refrigerant going through or near the compressor and with the centrifugal pump we're going to talk about cavitation where you have vapor bubbles at the impeller and what that can do. But there's a number of differences between the two devices Maybe the most obvious being that the centrifugal compressor is part of a phase change loop where you're oscillating between the vapor and the liquid phase to where a hydronic loop is going to stay in that liquid phase and it's going to change between a relatively cold and relatively hot liquid moving between those heat exchangers. The fluid in question in a compressor is going to be that refrigerant and with the pump is going to be some type of treated water. There might be corrosion inhibitors in there, and if it's going to be expected to see freezing conditions, there might be a percentage of glycol. And the equations that we use for heat transfer with water, this Q or heat load equals 500 times the water flow in GPM times the delta T in degree Fahrenheit, that's going to be modified somewhat depending on the amount of glycol used because there's different heat transfer characteristics of glycol, and that may derate the capacity somewhat of your system. The design of the centrifugal pump is going to be a little bit simpler, with the, uh, especially with the impeller. They're a little bit easier to replace or more standalone device compared to the compressor that's integrated with something like a water-cooled chiller. And they're a little bit smaller. So what do the guts of this thing look like? Well, there's a number of videos that you can see that show a graphical, animated, exploded view of these devices, which is kind of cool. It'll kind of help uh, capture that but just some screenshots here you see the red is the inlet side of the pipe and the blue is the discharge side when you disconnect those uh, those flanges and remove some of the pump casing you can start seeing the impeller which is that gold device that with that, those angled arms and that in itself is going to be removable so you can replace or trim those for different operating characteristics so there's a few fair amount of hand waving that just happened and will happen in these videos. Um, there are entire careers spent engineering and improving these devices, and we're just going to cover the basics so that we can get to talking about operating and performing and, and how these devices fit into our discussion of HVAC fundamentals. Uh, however, we've included some links for some more complicated topics if you'd like to go into more detail on your own. But let's cover a few basic terminology and orientation.
Water is going to enter the centrifugal pump at the suction side, also called the inlet or the upstream side of the pump. And it's going to go to the middle or the eye of the impeller, that red component. There's going to be an electric motor at the rear of the pump that's going to be through a drive shaft spinning the impeller and flinging the water to the edge of the pump casing, kind of like how kids get flung off a merry-go-round at the park. And then the liquid is going to be pressurized and exit on the discharge or downstream or high pressure side of the pump. So you can tell this orientation if the pump doesn't look quite like this. You can determine what's the suction side based on how it enters the pump. So suction side enters at the middle of the impeller and then the, the pressure side is going to be tangential to the pump casing. So if you remember only one thing from this video, from this first introduction, is that there's two key parameters for pumping systems, and that's the water flow that is needed and the pressure that that pumping system is expected to see. So the water flow is going to be determined by the heat load that needs to be met at the, the plant and the zone, and the pressure is going to be determined by all of the individual components and piping that is going to be part of that pump loop. Representing that visually, we can pretend that we're in that water path, and if we're on the left side of this graph and we just left the pump at high pressure, every length of pipe and every component that we see, we're going to have an incremental pressure drop. And the summation of all those pressure drops from when you leave the pump to when you get back to the suction of the pump is going to be the requirement that that pump has to put out to move that water through the system. So there's a lot of varieties of pump and flow because there's a lot of applications. So heating and cooling is really just a difference between, from the flow side, what that heat load is that needs to be addressed. From a pressure side, we can differentiate between closed and open systems in the sense that closed systems don't really deal with elevation head. Or in other words, the pump only needs to provide the amount of pressure to overcome the friction losses in the system. In an open system, the water loop is interacting with the atmosphere, which means that it has some elevation head it needs to provide pressure against in addition to the friction losses. So to give some examples about those flow and head or pressure combinations, we might expect a hydronic pump to look something like this. However, to look at some extreme examples, we have other high head, low head, or high flow, low flow applications. And you can see based on the shape and size of the impeller, and the size of the inlet and outlet piping flanges about how that can be accomplished. And with that flow and head combination with some other key components like the efficiency of the, that system at different places and the hours involved, we can determine what the pump performance or what the KWH is going to be to run that pump. And that's going to be the subject of our next video.